question in Syria and Ukraine. First of all, I'd like to say that Russia wants to build its relations with Germany based on the principles of mutual uh, benefit, uh, equal rights and respect for each other's interests. Uh, despite well-known political difficulties and fluctuations in the global economic situation, Germany remains Russia's leading economic partner. Uh, speaking of a bilateral trade, we noted the positive trend we saw recently. In January and February, our trade grew by 43%. We noted that Germany is uh, the biggest buyer of Russia's natural gas. Uh, Russian supplies cover 35% of uh, Germany's need. Uh, Germany is number one in investment in the Russian economy, over $16 billion. German companies use all the opportunities and uh, privileges available for working on the Russian market. We have about 5,000 companies with the German capital, with a total capital of over $50 billion. Uh, recently, the uh, Russo-German Working Group on Strategic Cooperation in economic, uh, in the economy and finance resumed its activities. This group has to resolve practical issues, establishing ties between businessmen of the two countries, helping them with implementing joint major projects. We also hope that this year a German businessman will participate more actively in the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. During our talks, we also discussed uh, furthering our humanitarian context, developing our scientific and educational context, cultural ties as well. Yet, we paid closest attention to the international agenda. As regards preparations for the upcoming G20 summit, we'll have a detailed discussion at the working breakfast, which will take place immediately after my our meeting with you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Russia and Germany work together in the G20 in uh, fighting, uh, financing terrorism, money laundering, and so on. Russia is willing to help Germany with its presidency in the G20. Uh, we will do our best to make sure that the summit in Hamburg is uh, productive and uh, conceptual. Uh, decisions based on consensus on international economy and finance are taken. We just had a meeting with uh, our delegations. We discussed the situation in Ukraine, which we are seriously concerned about. Uh, uh, we are constantly talking to Chancellor Merkel and other members of the Normandy Four. The last conversation in this dialogue took place on April 17th. The Normandy 4 should continue working on uh, resolving the Ukraine crisis. Uh, we will continue our work in this format even after presidential election in France, as we agreed in our last telephone conversation. Today we reaffirmed the need to, for the parties to abide by the Minsk Accords. We agree that uh, our priority should be to separate uh, parties uh, to the conflict to make sure that shellings stop. We should establish dialogue between Kiev and uh, unrecognized republics and uh, have uh, elections in the breakaway uh, regions. We believe that the special monitoring mission of the OSCE plays an important role in the area and tragic incidents like the recent uh, explosion of the OSCE vehicle uh, damage peacekeeping efforts and uh, further escalate tensions in the area. Thus, we need uh, to inve investigate the incident properly. As you remember, three years ago, uh, I have to remember this, there was a terrible tragedy that happened in Odessa. Ukrainian nationalists forced uh, helpless people in the House of Unions and burned them alive. The perpetrators have not been punished to this day. The international community should never forget about this incident and should never allow anything like that to happen in the future. We also exchanged our views on the situation in Syria. 
we said that it is necessary to intensify our efforts in the Astana and Geneva formats. We firmly believe that the Syrian conflict can only be resolved with peaceful measures and only under the aegis of uh, the United Nations. Russia pointed out that uh, there is need for thorough investigation of what happened on April 4th in uh, Han Sheikhun. We condemn any use of chemical weapons. Uh, those responsible in the deaths of uh, peaceful Syrian uh, people have to be found and punished, but this can only happen as a result of a thorough, unbiased investigation. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say that our talks with Madam Chancellor are always open and businesslike. During the post-war decade, Russia and Germany went through a long and um, complex way of uh, getting closer, and we should develop a bilateral ties for the benefit of our two nations in the interest of uh, peace and stability in Europe. Thank you. Yeah, I think also that it is a very good opportunity to have these conversations here. And I thank you for the invitation to Sochi. We had already a very intensive first part. And I think that we will also in the second part, in which we will talk more about the G20 president, and other international questions can also be continued with this conversation. Danke dafür, dass Russland ein konstruktiver Partner bei der Ausrichtung des G20-Gipfels in ähm, Hamburg sein will. Wir haben eine umfassende Agenda und ich glaube, die Ereignisse auf der Welt zeigen, dass multilaterale Kooperationen, die von Vorteil für alle sind, heute äh, dringender sind denn je. Und in diesem Geist wollen wir auch diese G20-Konferenz vorbereiten. Wir haben begonnen mit unseren bilateralen Beziehungen. Hier haben wir äh, durchaus ähm, erfreuliche Entwicklungen bei der wirtschaftlichen Kooperation. Ähm, für mich bleibt das Ziel, durch die Umsetzung der Minsker Vereinbarung auch ähm, zu dem Punkt zu kommen, wo wir die Sanktionen seitens der Europäischen Union wieder aufheben. Bilaterale Kontakte im Bereich der also we have bilateral contacts in economy and youth exchange, which I would like to remind you of. In one week, uh, we are celebrating the 72nd anniversary of the end of the Second World War. Two years ago, I came to Moscow on the occasion of the 17th anniversary, and I would like to remind you what kind of victims um, the Soviet Union occurred back then, and we must never forget these events, these historic events. This is the spirit in which we need to shape our relationships. I would like to thank uh, Russia and the President for the fact that the honoring of uh, war victims is, uh, comes as a matter of fact. This means a lot. We talked about the development of the Petersburg Dialogue. I think the Petersburg Dialogue has become a forum in which it is possible to address also critical issues in an open way. And I attach great value to fostering exchange, even if there are differences. In this context, we also talked about rights and possibilities of, of the civil society in Russia. I mentioned a topic the Russian-German house in Kaliningrad. I think we mentioned some solutions. The process will, be come, to, will come to an end soon. And I would also like to point out that it's very important to have the right to demonstrate in a, demo, in a democracy. And also the role of NGOs is very important. Also, we have uh, had reports about uh, bad uh, treatments of homosexuals in Chechnya, and I urge the presidents to v wield his influence in order to grant minority rights, like as uh, the, is, is happening with uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. We talked about international issues. I think that 
our recent telephone call uh, relating to the Minsk format was very important because we agreed after the uh, elections in France to keep the process going. It is a very painstaking process. We are taking baby steps, but um, I support what has been said, uh, namely the work of OSCE observers. Uh, this is, uh, has um, a very great value, which is why we need to protect uh, those people who make an effort to ensure the rights of people. We also need to uh, get the process of decentralization and deconcentration a step further. We keep getting to the point uh, zero of the Minsk Accords when we said that we need a ceasefire and uh, as a result of which other political steps can be identified. We have started um, conceiving political perspectives, but this process is really essential when it comes to the exchange of prisoners and so on. But we need to make a commitment to the political process in terms of the Minsk Accords. And I will say also in, in behalf of the foreign minister, we will uh, we will not back away from efforts and will keep our commitment going. Also, we talked about the situation in Syria. As a federal chancellor, I made clear that we will do everything in order to support a ceasefire, especially to help those people who are in immediate need and um, emergency. This is something that could be further elaborated. I also took the occasion to talk about Libya because this is an, an immense challenge. We are in agreement about international terrorism. The links and the cooperation can be intensified between Germany and Russia, but we are doing our contribution to fighting international terrorism and there is consensus with Russia on that. All in all, we discussed at length and there is the possibility to continue these talks. There are disagreements, but I think that international policy and politics means um, searching the dialogue again and again and in the view of the 72nd anniversary of the end of the world war we sh should not falter in striving uh, f for a world uh, where many people have become insecure we will now take two questions from our Russian and German media we will now take two questions from our Russian and German media as always we'll start with our visitors Andreas Rinke Reuters Andreas Rinke Reuters Andreas Rinke by Reuters. Madam Chancellor, you talked about the Ukraine. Isn't it more realistic to establish a new agreement after Minsk because the separation from the territories of the separatists is actually processing? Uh, the recognition of passports or uh, talking about the ruble. What do you think about UN observers, maybe even armed uh, observers? And Mr. President, there were a lot of arrests in Russia and also attacks to uh, oppositionals. Why is, does the Russian government decide to have such a crackdown and what does it do against terrorism? If I may start, I don't think it's wise to negotiate a new agreement at the moment. In, uh, within the scope of the Minsk agreement, we can continue our work. I'm not satisfied with the fact that, that there are further separating tendencies, uh, when, for example, when it comes to recognizing passports from separatist uh, regions. This is also about uh, building up some kind of blockade. We need to readdress these questions and uh, roll this back. From the Russian point of view, we have heard that this is, uh, relates to a sm slow process relating to regulations. 
But to us, it's important to see that Ukraine gets access to its own borders, but uh, the ceasefire and political solutions that will make elections possible, there are a basic foundation that we haven't achieved yet, but this is not a reason to brush this, for the br to brush this aside. I don't think a new agreement is a good idea. The implementation is the problem, not the accords, and all sides are, need to do their jobs. The key is, and I would like to ask the Russian president to ensure the ceasefire, because this is the only way of getting a climate in the U Ukraine that will prevent um, or that would that will ensure a compromise in Lugansk and Donetsk. When it comes to UN troops, we agree that the, the OSCE observers do a brilliant job and what can be done by the OSCE is being done and I would like to encourage OSCE, OSCE observers, they need to be supported by Russia, by Ukraine, but also by the Normandy format and I think we shouldn't lose time looking for other formats that won't uh, bring about other results. I will start with the first uh, part of your question. I'm grateful to you for both the first part and the second part. And out of uh, respect to your readers and viewers and listeners, you did all you could. I hope you will convey what I'm about to say in response to your first part and the second part. First, as regards uh, what happened in eastern Ukraine, this is a result of an anti-constitutional coup in Kiev. That's number one. Number two, these territories were never separated by anybody. Uh, it's the Ukrainian authorities who separate them uh, doing anything they can, including blockade. I would like to mention that Russia continues supplying goods, including energy, uh, supplying coke for the Ukrainian uh, metal industry, steel industry, but it was the Ukrainian authorities who organized uh, this blockade. We did not introduce uh, the ruble there as a, a, an alternative currency. Basically, the Ukrainian authorities uh, withdrew the Ukrainian national currency, the hryvnia, from the territory. And uh, people living in those territories had uh, nothing, uh, no alternative but to use some other currency. And uh, many different currencies uh, are used there, including the Russian ruble. But because of special economic ties with Russia, of course, the ruble is popular there. Now, as regards privatization or rather nationalization of uh, companies, nobody nationalized those companies, nobody seized them from uh, legitimate owners. But since those companies in the unrecognized territories were unable to get raw materials from Ukraine, were unable to ship their goods to Ukraine, people who work for those companies, for those factories, have to live somehow and uh, the, the only option was for their companies to go into administration. I want your readers, I want your listeners to know this. Nobody seized anything from anybody. And finally, how can those companies uh, operate if they have absolutely no way to get at least uh, some basic revenue from uh, their business? Because the Kiev authorities suspended any kind of financial transactions with those territories. They don't have banks, they don't have the financial system, and all this on the initiative of the current Kiev authorities. Our partners in Europe mentioned at one point that they would be willing to help the Ukrainian authorities to restore normal uh, operation of financial institutions there, but unfortunately, our partners in Kiev did all they could to make sure that those plans of our European partners were never implemented. So, what happens today uh, is a forced measure. 
is a necessary measure. And I can agree, I uh, can only agree with uh, Madam Chancellor that uh, we have no alternative and there is nothing else we can invent besides uh, the Normandy 4 and uh, the Minsk Accords. We can make no new plans unless we achieve certain results on what we have already decided in years past. As regards the OEC, like I said in my opening remarks, the OEC plays an extremely important role there, and we should do our best to uh, help the OEC work effectively there. Now, as regards protests in Russia and what uh, our authorities uh, do. We discussed this issue with Madam Chancellor as well, and I pointed out to her, and I would like to point out to you now, that uh, Russia's uh, law enforcement is much more liberal and reserved than uh, their colleagues in some European countries where they use tear gas to break up protests and batons. Uh, in Russia, thank God, we have never had to use those so far. Our law enforcement operates within the law, and will continue to do so in the future. They will maintain order and discipline, but at the same time, they will also respect the rights of the Russian people to express their views freely. But everything has to be done within the law. Now a question from Russian media, Interfax. Interfax, Mr. Putin and head of the state of Germany. Well, you have mentioned the Normandy 4, that this form is going to continue its operation after the elections in France. But there is a big question whether it's effective or not. We have seen no results and the Minsk agreements have been stalling so far. And you said it yourself. So how can you assess the efficiency of that format of the Normandy 4. Maybe there should be some attempts made to reanimate it, to revitalize it. So what should be done to make it work again? Well, I'd like to say that this format is working. Without this format, the situation would have been much worse than it is today. This is already something, and it means a lot, I assure you. But uh, what else can be done? We should make sure that uh, representatives of uh, the Kiev authorities and representatives of the unrecognized republics come together and sit down at one table. It's impossible to resolve this conflict without a direct dialogue between conflicting parties. This has never happened in the world, and I hope that this happens uh, one day. And of course, we have to be consistent in implementing the agreements we have achieved. I won't go into details right now. Last time we had this kind of meeting in Berlin, we had a long and detailed discussion, you may even say an argument. Uh, we disagree on some points, but I strongly believe that uh, the current Kyiv authorities maybe missed uh, their opportunity to implement the Minsk Accords when they had a way to do so because of their political situation. Uh, within the country. Today, they don't have that much room for maneuver because of uh, certain circumstances, including the economic and political situation in Ukraine. But still, we need to continue with our efforts in the Normandy 4 format uh, within uh, the Minsk Accords. Like I said, we can't make new plans before we implement the plans that we have already, uh, with, that we already have. From my part, I would like to say something. We disagree on the causes of this conflict. We think that the Ukrainian government came to power in a democratic way. The president has the responsibility to implement the Minsk Accords. But despite of this fact, we decided to choose a common format in order to prevent further escalation. Of course, it is possible to be dissatisfied with the implementation, but I would like to say that we are within a process which will prevent that much worse things will happen. At the beginning, before establishing the Normandy format, many, many people lost their lives. They're still soldiers of 
getting killed of the Ukrainian army due to the fact that the Ukrainian side is not here. I would like to mention that also the Ukrainian side is committed to implement, implement what has been decided. There are disagreements over and over again. But there are also talks uh, via contact groups and the step we need to achieve is getting an electoral process going that will result in a legitimized uh, pr situation in Donetsk and Lugansk. Based on this we will have t uh, direct talks. What we need for this is a roadmap and painstaking efforts. But I believe that the program is very clear, which is why we need to keep working on this. Peace. Christina Dunst, German Press Agency. Thank you, Madam Chancellor. There have been reproaches that Russland, uh, Russia has influenced the electoral campaign in the United States. How sure are you that Russia won't influence the German electoral campaign? Mr. President, um, you're reported to be the person having the uh, most influence on uh, potentate Assad in Syria. Is your influence really that big or is your interest uh, in ending this gruesome war not that big um, due to um, strategic reasons, maybe? And what can you do to end the conference? Well, I can't say anything about the, the elections in the United States, but I'm not that afraid. When I'm... Uh, Heading towards an electoral campaign, I have my own approach. There has been this case of Lisa or uh, the situation in Lithuania with our soldiers. Of course, we take decisive measures. Other than that, we rely on interacting with our citizens. We are aware of the fact that cyber crime is an international challenge these days. And the Russian military doctrine also touches upon the topic of hybrid uh, military strategy, but I think that and believe that uh, we will have no problem during the electoral campaign in Germany, even if there are disagreements. We never interfere in uh, other countries' politics. And we really want nobody to meddle in our internal affairs, in our politics. Unfortunately, we see the opposite happen for years. For years, we have seen attempts to influence political processes in Russia through the so-called NGOs and directly. Realizing the futility of such efforts, uh, we, it, it has never occurred to us uh, to interfere in other countries' internal affairs. That's number one. Number two, you mentioned uh, the example with the United States, but nobody has been able to prove this. These are just rumors used for internal uh, political struggle in the U.S. And based on that, you make allegations regarding European countries, including such a friendly uh, country for Russia as Germany. This is uh, strange, to say the least. Finally, regarding Syria, it's the people of Syria who have most influence on President Assad. Of course, Syria is uh, very much fragmented and uh, we see a lot of problems in Syria. We should uh, create conditions for uh, Syria to come together, for hostilities to cease, and for this mutual destruction to cease. We need to create conditions for political interaction between all the political forces. What kind of conditions are we talking about? First of all, there is a need for ceasefire, and we were able to achieve that together with our Turkish and Iranian partners as part of the Astana process. We believe that uh, this situation uh, 
this ceasefire, this truce, has to be strengthened further. And uh, this is what our representatives will work on in Astana tomorrow and the day after, together with the Syrian parties to the conflict. And we will also continue uh, working within the Geneva process. Of course, without the the United States, it would be impossible to resolve this problem effectively. So we will continue our dialogue with our U.S. partners, and I hope that uh, we'll uh, come to common understanding regarding the steps that need to be taken in this very sensitive area of the world today. Thank you. The final question from the Russian media, Pavel Zarubin. My question goes to both leaders. Well, you've said it yourself, I think. Most of the time you've been discussing global issues, and perhaps my question will be a bit frank, too direct, but our bilateral relations, how good are they? Or you talk about crises only in terms of our bilateral relations, and the G20 discuss economy issues, but the world sees lots of economic problems of all kinds. But if we have any positive outcomes of our recent relations, so can we contribute to the improvement of the global situation in terms of economy? Like I said in my opening remarks, Germany is uh, Russia's uh, number two partner after China. Uh, this means we have a lot of uh, mutual interests. Uh, Russia is uh, number one in terms of investment, $16.5 billion in the Russian economy. And uh, Russian investors, by the way, have invested uh, quite an amount in the German economy, almost nine over eight uh, billion dollars through our cooperation russia and germany have uh, tens of thousands of jobs our cooperation is not the bubble it's not uh, just something written on paper something that i and uh, madam chancellor have signed there are hundreds of companies uh, hundreds of thousands of people behind us. And of course, our cooperation is a major contribution to stabilizing the global economy. Uh, is there a future to our relations? Of course there is. In January in February alone, like I said, I trade grew by 43%. That's bilateral trade between Russia and Germany. This is quite a figure. Yes, uh, we still have uh, many problems, many obstacles in our way, but this is what we are going to discuss as part of the uh, agenda that Germany suggested for the G20. And we will certainly discuss that on the margins. What else can we do to lift uh, the barriers that hinder the global economy from developing? I hope that the G20 platform uh, uh, the, and Germany is currently working on the agenda for G20. I hope that uh, this will, this platform will certainly help us. In my opinion, even if there are serious disagreements in some areas, we need to keep the dialogue going. The president pointed to the uh, question of how econ economic relations are developing. In science, there are long-standing and intensive relations. But the situation of people is so important. The students on both sides, Russian students in Germany and vice versa. This could be increased in perspective. There's a really fruitful youth exchange. Even despite political disagreements, we should keep a cultural exchange going because culture is a way of getting people together. And I would like to point to the Pet Petersburg dialogue. In Germany, there was a dramatic discussion about whether it is uh, fruitful to keep working within the Petersburg dialogue. I personally, but also the former foreign minister, now f federal president Frank-Walter Steinleiter, made a commitment to keep this process going. Also, the Russian side agreed. And, of course, these discussions are sometimes very heated and em emotional disagreements. I think they need to be 
dealt with, they need to be tabled because if we don't, the understanding of the other side will decrease. And you talked about uh, the implementation of the Minsk process. We, you could admit that it is going slowly, that we don't move ahead. There are uh, things such as the Steinmeier formula that could be dealt with in 30 seconds, but we need to get back to the negotiation table and by talking you maintain the understanding for one another, which is very important if you look at the history of our both nations over the centuries. It is paramount that we go back, uh, reopen the communication dialogue over and over again, and you always learn something.